And you're welcome along. Slight Tangent is coming at you for the second week in a row. These are exciting times. To my left, we have Mick McCarthy. Hello. Hello. Arthur O'Dea, good evening. Nice, thanks, Joe. Willow Callahan. hello to you. You are setting very high standards by saying, oh, two weeks in a row. Maybe it'll be three. It's a run. Will there be a three-peat? That's the question. <laughs> it's a streak at this stage, yeah. I'm yeah. away next week. <laughs> you know, just so you're aware. <laughs> Cold water on it already. Punctured a certain momentum. I have right a now. plan. Oh. It's a cunning plan. Okay. Ooh. It may or may not involve slight tangent. We'll see. I'll start with emails. So. A slight tangent at offtheball.com. Yes, indeed. The best of the best, I would say, of emails that we get into the entire station. There's a high quality of correspondence. If you can judge a person by their friends, you can judge a slot by its correspondence. Yes, absolutely. And we've a lot of people with too much time on their hands. You say correspondence. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it to the emails. <laughs> we've, yeah. we've wider correspondence that... Love y'all. Slight tangents at offtheball.com. So, uh, not a huge amount of emails uh, to get through this evening. We picked out the ones that caught our eye. Hi, lads. I think this segment is the best show that you make. Keep up the great work. That's not the reason we picked That's this That's why segment. I call it the key to get on. I have uh, two unrelated topics for you to discuss. Item number one. Uh, what do you think when a pundit describes a rugby player, especially a forward, as, quote-unquote, a great footballer? It drives me up the wall every time I hear it. I'll show a slight bit of tolerance towards a back who regularly kicks the ball being described as a great footballer. Maybe a Johnny Sexton or Ross Byrne or James Lowe, but certainly not a forward. What's wrong with just saying he's a great rugby player? So this is, these are the high quality emails <laughs> that we've <laughs> deciphered. What about some so of the high quality kicks we've seen from forwards? I'm thinking of Keith Wood kicking a drop goal here. Tyburn. Yeah, but Tyburn had a... <laughs> I know, we can cling on to it though. Tyburn had a really good kick through back in the November Internationals. Remember the one that uh, Tyg Furlong kicked into the backfield where he just mulleted it up in the air? But yeah. It's nothing to do with kicking, though. It's, it's, not, because, it's, it's because the game is called rugby football and yeah. the, football, like the, the term football isn't owned by soccer. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. the sport is a type of football. Like when Tyg I just wanted to defend the odd time that Paul yeah, no, no. the ball here. <laughs> when, it's when, an enjoyable thing. When Tyg Furlong shows those lovely hands, yeah. the commentator may say, oh, he's a great footballer. Yeah. But there's a, like, I mean, in, in the Southern Hemisphere, well, in Australia and New Zealand anyway, like, you know, you would regularly hear them describe it as footy. Mm. You know, the, the Australian captain in November, we're the only ones trying to play footy here. Mm. You know, to the ref. <laughs> that was a bit more New Zealand the accent, wasn't it, as well? <laughs> <laughs> you love when I put myself out there, don't you? <laughs> Fair play, like, you went for it. <laughs> Why have I got Matt Williams in my head every time I hear the word footy as well? Yeah, That's says, what I mean, yeah, they call it that in Australia. Yeah. Like, so if sure. you, do you disagree with our emailer here? Yeah, I think that I just don't think that uh, I think rugby's is entitled to call itself football, certainly as NFL. <laughs> and you know, work, if you though, become a rugby it? player, like you can be, you're, you know, if you have a bit of skill, you're a good footballer. You know, it's okay. Rugby football doesn't work though. Like, it's just rugby. Yeah, unless you're Bill McLaren. Bill McLaren would call it rugby football in I a way that, that would make you feel emotional. Yeah. Well, given that they both come from the same game, essentially. They're codified differently, football and rugby. Yeah. I think the fact they've got a common starting point means it's more than fine to call it football. It, it does obviously complicate it for us here where we call football exclusively football. But then again, we call Gaelic football where primarily you hand pass football yeah. as well. Oh. Let's, let's not get back into this. <laughs> We've had 24 hours of this. So our official <laughs> uh, slight tangent response to Brian, and thank you for the email, Brian, is we're entitled to say he's a great footballer when we're talking about rugby players. And it doesn't have to be a kick in the ball. <laughs> I'm waiting for the... the I, no, no, no. I literally, I know it's a bit of a, breaking a kind of a golden rule. I think nothing about this. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I have no, no say whatsoever. I, Listen, important I, email to start That's the off. selling point of this yeah. slot. Uh, point two, Brian continues. What do you think of the general public's reaction would be if Ireland got to or won the Rugby World Cup? Would it reach the same levels as Italian 90? Would the celebration reach similar levels across the entire country or would it be very promoted in the corporate world and celebrated in the big rugby areas, but less so on the ground in non-traditional rugby areas? Do the hardcore GA and soccer fans get behind them or stay indifferent? Thanks, kind regards, Brian. I don't think it's anything like Italian 90. No, I wasn't there, but, you know, I mean, from what you gather, I don't think it'd be anything even close to that. No. But I wonder to the extent as to which it will happen because I feel there's an ingrained conversation and uh, decision that's already been made about the Irish rugby team because we've been having this culture war for so long in a way that, like, if a sport that you didn't care about... Like, 
take for example when the hockey team made the World Cup final, right? That was an incredible achievement and something that I think the whole country got behind in a really kind of natural, organic way and people were truly delighted with that journey and went along with it and then didn't care about hockey again a few weeks later, in fairness, you know, the general the general public. I think with rugby there's it's it's so much bigger in our mind already that it's like it will naturally be a bigger thing than that, but it also probably has less room to bring people along mm. that were on the outside that didn't care in the first place because people have already made their decision on the sport and the culture around rugby. I think those who would be against the idea of the Irish rugby team doing well would be unlikely to be swayed by a victory in a quarter-final or a semi-final in a World Cup where then automatically they become rugby fans for the World Cup final. I think they're the type of people who would criticise a marketing campaign like this is rugby country or they hate the fact that there's a whole lot of coverage about the Leinster Schools Cup in the broadsheets during the year. That fan is unlikely, I think, to get on the bandwagon to get behind the rugby team in the same way that, say, the Olympics draws people out every four years to get behind the rowers, to get behind Kelly Harrington. The fact as well that because it was the first World Cup in Italia 90, probably helped with the bandwagonism of it a little bit as well, that the Irish team... That would happen again. Qualified. Something similar to it anyway. If we got like to a semi-final or something like that in the Football World Cup, I think the country well, would Well, with mad. the rugby team, there's a narrative that it's like, ah, this is a team who do quite well in Six Nations and then they get to a World Cup and usually it falls flat around the quarter-final. It's not that same kind of, I guess, journey into the unknown that it would have been with the football team in 88 yeah. and 90. What do you think? Um, like, like, you can read a lot into the premise of the question. So, like, say the hockey example, there were just a lot of people that I'd say were indifferent to it and didn't voice that indifference, so you didn't really take much notice of them. Mm. Whereas the reason the question is being asked is that a lot of people in this country hate rugby and what it represents and what yeah. it stands for and they're vociferous on that point. Yeah. So I think actually they're quite unlikely to change. No, absolutely. As is their right. Um, Ireland win a Grand Slam, they'll kind of cross their arms a little bit and they'll think, well, it's only how many countries and, you know, whatever. There's always qualifications for all of these things, yeah. yeah and yeah. that would I think that would apply to the World Cup. I think Ireland could win the World Cup and still the percentage of people who dislike... Uh, rugby and, and what it stands for and I saw like I understand why people feel yeah. it's very much the establishment sport and, and find it uh, off-putting for that reason I think they would still uh, have a reasonable argument to cross their hands and say okay so they came top of six or seven countries whoop de doo yeah I, I don't think they would suddenly be in, inspired to support but I, I, where I disagree like where the Brian talks about um you know, would it be celebrated outside of South Dublin, Cork, Limerick? Oh, no. It's not like that at all. No. Uh, like, the Six Nations matches, um, and I obviously take a kind of <laughs> extra interest, <laughs> they're the most watched uh, events of the year, mm. yeah. along with the two Ireland finals. Like, I think number three on the list last year was the France-Ireland match. Late, late show, toy show. There's always up there, yeah. Maybe football Ireland, Ireland then Ireland-France, and I think hurling might have been fourth. Yeah. I think in 2020, yeah, sport was seven of the top 12 and the Six Nations matches yeah. dominated so outside the, the, the... Like, rugby is not a popular participation sport. But, I mean, in effect, the whole country is sitting down to watch these matches. But there is just probably a pretty vocal... That's what I was going to say. ...minority. How big it is, I don't know, who have, um, you know, who find it all just a little off-putting. I think I it's... I think it's... Sorry, Will. I think it's a sizable group. I don't think it's as big as sometimes it makes out but I do think it is sizable. I think there's a fairly decent uh, group of sports loving people in this country who really dislike rugby, what it stands for, what they think it stands for, what the team, what they think the team and in some ways sometimes are indifferent to whether Ireland win or not and sometimes actively want Ireland to lose, right? I do think that in terms of the potential for a bandwagon there's a massive middle ground and you've just laid out the numbers as to what to describe. There's an awful lot of people who will, you'll hear talking about GEA in pubs and say, geez, the rugby lads were great at the week. And that's what they'll describe them as, the rugby lads. It's a foreign thing to them. Yeah. But they like it and watch it and want Ireland to do well. And that I think that bandwagon will get huge come semi-final of a World Cup. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I think it'll, the place will go rugby crazy, really. Mm. Would be my sense. Uh, last uh, email... Truly rugby country, then. From Eamon Conway. <laughs> See, I do think some of the marketing... Really Doesn't grinds the, the craw for people. Or Shane Ross uh, op-eds in the uh, Sunday Independent. But similarly, uh, Joe, I think um, this idea that it's like, because it's almost framed in the email itself, will the football and GA crowd get on board? 
Mm. I think there's a lot of people who are fans of multiple sports who actually yeah, of enjoy the rugby. It's just that we're so aware of that minority who are incredibly vocal about their dislike of it. And I can understand why they would dislike certain elements around rugby. Mm. Eamon Conway then, uh, dear Joey and the cronies, says the texture. <laughs> Joey and the cronies. I like that Joey has stayed from last week though. Sounds like a shite band from 1975 who got <laughs> on the top of the pops one time. Long time listener, first time emailer, says Eamon Conway. Uh, grew up in Brussels, played underage club soccer from the age of 6 to 18. Fast forward 15 years, I've moved back to Dublin since going to college. I've recently moved to Clontarf and uh, walking the dog in St. Anne's. My God, Eamon. We're passing each other. We may have passed each other just today. <laughs> uh, one thing is glaringly obvious that may well be well-trodden ground, I'm aware. It is well-trodden ground, but we'll go there for a moment. The underage GEA games in St. Anne's, I presume he's talking about, are all played on suitably sized pitches with suitably sized goals. Then you see the soccer kids, who must be 10 years old, playing on a full pitch with full size goal posts. It looks and is ridiculous. How are we supposed to develop kids with proper training technique? and uh, a feel for the game from a young age if they're playing a game that's skewed with farcical dimensions. This is not to mention the fact that in Europe you would never even at under eights need to get changed on the side of a pitch or in a car. It would be a proper changing room, showers, clubhouse, etc. I realise changing this would have big uh, financial and planning roadblocks but surely some adequately sized goalposts and pitches is an easy win and we'd have a fighting chance of having a proper golden generation in five, ten years' time just like Belgium. Yours, Eamon Conway. Well, when I was a lad, we used to have... I was a lad. Yeah, we used Not to have goals. yesterday, Will. Yeah, exactly. We had goals that we used to roll <laughs> onto the pitch. So generally, when we were up to under 12, I think the pitch was reduced from the edge of the box on both ends, and the sidelines were also brought in with cones. And then the idea would be that you would have smaller goalposts that you didn't have a goalkeeper who was 12 years of age and was very small and was just getting chipped with every shot that was going in mm. which would be completely demoralising and also the idea that if there's just way too much space on the pitch you're not going to pass the ball around because the much easier thing to do would be to just kick it into space your fast winger would then run into yeah, the that's, space that's the way ball. football is played I find for yeah. the most part in underage in Ireland yeah you know? well, so I mean we all agree on that we all yeah. understand it's ridiculous Eamon's point is that his, his uh, sense of soccer facilities to use the differentiation as opposed to Gaelic football facilities in the country well he's not I don't know if he's saying about the facilities as such as, as yes. opposed to the we don't um, we don't you know play the games on adequate size pitches and stuff but the, no, the I, changing I, on the side of the pitch is something that GEA players do as well like, yeah you know, no I, 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 yeah. I, no I do think he is making the point of facilities as well that like specifically for football versus GEA. Yeah. Yeah well I look I did we talk when did we talk about this very recently but like I I'm the fact that I just feel that football doesn't put its best foot forward in, you know, it's like GEA and to a lesser extent, but increasingly uh, rugby, put itself forward as the, you know, culture of the country and, you know, making it, you know, make that imprint in a way that football in many, many ways actually is, but doesn't ha doesn't leave that imprint on towns and communities well, it's across it's the country. it's been badly, terribly run for far too long. Oh, 100%, yeah. But, like, I mean, one of those things is, for example, that, not sorting out that. Not so, Like, I, I go for, like, a uh, uh, walk, especially in the summertime, around there's literally four pitches in a line on this park where it's two GEA pitches and two soccer pitches and they're public and they're used by different clubs and so on and so forth. You're watching, you get one half, you're going really well-organised GEA, there's blitzes, there's two halves of the pitcher being used for underage games. You walk up to the football and it's a rabble. It's like, it's watching what Will's describing there as like under 10s playing full pitches where there's no skill involved, there's no ending because it's just like hoofing the ball as far as you can because there's so much space on the pitch that it's not, it's not, reflective of what an adult game of football mm -hmm. actually is and it's just it depresses you a little bit you know what I mean And but the only people who could do anything about this are football people in the country and almost forcing the hand of making them it, I don't know if it starts with being more a part of the community or whatever it might be I know it does obviously happen in a lot of places there's an awful lot of well run junior yeah. underage football See, clubs around I, the country don't get me wrong I just think that it's too often that it's too often we see yeah. the kind of half you know, sort of buy a shoestring sort of element of it all. True. Like, definitely there's a lot of brilliantly run football clubs. So that's Eamon's experience walking through that one park. Yeah, but I think Whereas it's a lot of parks, yeah. It's more, I, I, where I would agree with him is 
in spite of the many extremely well-run football clubs. So I played GAA and soccer growing up. Now, admittedly, the GAA club had its clubhouse first and had better facilities first, but brilliant people in the locality of Selbridge got the rack together and built Bally Ulster Football Club from one pitch and no changing rooms into an amazing clubhouse, amazing pitches, astroturf, uh, floodlight facilities, you know, pristine, really got together, the community came mm. together, mm. young, energised people did an, an, a wonderful job. So there are lots of examples like that out there. But I do agree in the main, uh, it's far more likely to be a shoddily run uh, soccer pitch. And I was talking to a friend of mine who I grew up with playing football, mm. uh, soccer. And he's got kids of an age now and he has no like GEA background, just never played GEA, always soccer, soccer, soccer. And I was asking him, what, what's the young fella doing sporting wise? And he said, like, he's like, I can't believe it. Like I'm a GEA dad. Same and here, he, yeah, he said, friends, yeah. he said, I mean, I go, I, akin to your point, akin to your point, bring him up to the GEA pitch. There are like a thousand parents yeah. just eager to volunteer in any way they can. Can I move this cone? I just want to be part of it. And X number of coaches, the cones, the bibs, everything is amazing. Well funded, uh, a spirit of volunteerism. And he said, so like we go up to that, but then I go to the soccer, it's like torn bibs, two footballs between 20 lads, no parents hanging around. Now that's just one experience, but that was his experience. It tallies with Eamon, the emailer's experience. Uh, I think it, it, was, would, it would make you worry that we're having another generation where things aren't being done right. Mm. I think if we started again, so you ripped up all the structures that are here right now, municipal facilities like they have in Europe is probably what we would bring in, whereby if there's capital sports funding coming in, really facilities which are being developed should be for multiple sports. You, no, to I totally agree with that. So facilities are no-brainer. Do you think there's something in the volunteerism aspect? Do you think the GA parent is more likely to think, oh, it's the association, I have to give my time, and the soccer parent is almost, yeah. it's a more professional sphere, I'll just hand over my kids and let them babysit them. That's a, that's a big do you, think it, do you think it comes from that? I think it comes from structure. I think it comes from, again, like, I know where the GEA uh, club is near me. Yeah. I don't know where the soccer club is. I know what it is. I know where they play most of their games, but I don't know where the club is. I don't know. It doesn't have that heart of the community feel. I think that it's, it's establishment reasons, and I think it's, like, structure that comes from many, many years of the GEA just being better at this than soccer. Yeah. And I think it's because, it's not because people are any different. It's because football, I think, is left to its own devices too much. The GEA is a much better run organisation than the FAI and has been for decades. Yeah. And maybe that's evening up now, I don't know, but you're chasing, in some ways, a lost cause. Like, it just, it's just, that, that's the thing that gets to me most, is that I do feel that, you know, this is not for any cultural reason. This is for an organisational logistics, reason, mm. you know, and that's what kind of bothers me about it because we should, like, in fairness, you know, we talk about the GEA sometimes as parochial and different things and not outside of Ireland, but the way it is run is the way to run youth sports yeah. in this country and our biggest sport and our biggest export sport in a way, if you want to look at it that way, where we're seeing most on the world stage, doesn't seem to take itself seriously enough. Mm. And that, in, in terms of its development and everything else, you know, and again, we're talking in generalizations, we're talking in experiences and a little bit of knowledge about it and research and different things, but not in a, we're in no way saying this is the case with your club. Yeah. This might not be, but it is too often the case. Yeah. I think even when it comes to winning the hearts and minds of the kids, though, you consider that most counties around the country have got maybe one games development officer in football. And you could have multiple games development officers in clubs in GA. They just have a bigger reach in terms yeah. of how they can actually get kids I, involved. I, on the cultural point, I do think there is something of GA members though where there's like a, a real uh, kind of passion to hand the association over to the next generation. Like a pride in what it is and what it represents. Do you think it's the association or do you think it's like your club? And well, that, that can I mean, exist in football, but tomato, doesn't often. Tomato, enough, tomato, so. the association, your club, that's that's so intertwined in yeah. GEA. Yeah, it's true, yeah. Well, like, I just always take the, the local example of the town in Clare that I'm from, like, you know, that my family's from. One GEA club won the first ever, um, you know, Clare Senior Championship in 18, whatever. They've had five, six different soccer clubs in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. It forms, it collapses, it rebuilds. Very hard to build that and to make it as important to your culture and history as the one that's been around since 
Yeah. A hundred years before you were born. No, that's true. You know, like it is, that, that does happen a lot as well. Like Arthur, concluding thoughts? I don't know. It's an interesting thing. I don't have any of that attachment to a club or that type of thing. So I don't, I don't it doesn't resonate with me at all. I suppose it's just, it's, um, as you were kind of saying, football is an international thing. It's not so local in terms of the GA. There's no, it is an end and means in and of itself, effectively. Whereas I would almost wager, I'd love to know, but I would suggest there's probably more kids across the country with soccer jerseys of one shape or another than GA jerseys. Oh, yeah. Mm. yeah. So, you know what I mean? It's still kind of the dominant sort of interest and in everything else. Yeah. But it just, I suppose, it, it, it resonates on further shores than just here. Mm. Mm. But I suppose that's our point. Like, if that is the case and there is more of an interest in football, then why isn't it harnessed better? Our, you know, why isn't it our jewel in the crown when it comes to how sport is run in the country? Yeah. You know, it should be purely by numbers. Our biggest sport should be our best sport, you know? Yeah. Let's take a very short break. We will continue with a slight tangent in just one minute. And you're welcome back. Slight Tangent continues. Myself and Will and Mick and Arthur. So I guess this is where we as a team come together and chat about some of the events of the week is uh, part of the concept. Tiger Woods made himself part of the week. He uh, was playing in the Genesis. I think people are well aware at this stage. Round one, Justin Thomas hit a drive which was shorter than Tiger's. Therefore, Tiger said, you hit like a girl. What better way to signify that than give you a tampon? Uh, this was picked up not so much on TV, but photographer got it, and then the footage uh, was subsequently shown on TV. Justin Thomas sees what it is, recoils, laughs, drops it on the fairway. Was the weird thing. I mean, if you're on the let the hell pick it up in the group behind them. Be like, what is this? And so this prompted much discussion, outcry, everywhere from big columnists across the US and beyond to Liveline. There's a full hour of Liveline, which I couldn't recommend enough. <laughs> <laughs> Once you're done here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Tiger's um, apology was, if I offended anybody, it was not the case. <laughs> I don't know what that means, Tiger. <laughs> it was a bit of a misspeak. Not an apology. He was trying to say, obviously, yeah, it wasn't my intention, but he simply said, if I offended anybody, it's not the case. It was just friends having fun. It was just, we play pranks on one another all the time. Uh, so I'm curious for general thoughts on this. I spoke to uh, somebody in my world and, uh, she's a golfer and like has a very broad and even edgy sense of humour and she really took a dim view of this. I have to say I did as well if I'm being honest. I understand there will be the inclination to defend Tiger against being cancelled forevermore and nobody is saying that, I don't think. But it is incredibly grim that this is where he is at 47 years of age. And I suppose... Um, like rather than get so angry about it and take this as like a considered commentary on behalf of men, because you know how I don't think that's what it is. It's just Tiger Woods being Tiger Woods. It is an interesting insight into where he is. He's a very complicated person, and um, you could talk about him for an hour and, and scratch the surface. But there is no doubt, like in this particular sphere, he grew up, like, in his own words, a nerd. There is like an antisocial aspect to much of his behaviour. Uh, if anyone's read the Armin Kateyan book, there's a scene where he's waiting to play golf with Bill Clinton. And he tells them, um, as they're having breakfast at Augusta and Clinton's due to arrive, he tells them what he can't wait to talk to Bill about. And again, it's a very immature, uh, grim line from Tiger. It's in the book. I wasn't there, so I'm not going to repeat it. But, you know, I did. You don't want to say the word on uh, radio. There's, there's also not one yeah. to say the word on radio. And uh, I, I've never heard that story disputed at any stage and it's it's been in the book for some years now and I suppose there's that John Giles line as well that you go into the dressing room age 16 and you, you leave age 16 so it's probably an insight into the atmosphere on tour I think it's also damning of the golf media like they are, are desperate to present Tiger as this avuncular redeemed elder statesman like that is the Tiger Woods brand now mm -hmm. and in one fell swoop, he completely exposes what nonsense that really is. And it's just a joke. Yeah, it's just a joke. Like I, look, I think we'd all concede we, we see casual sexism on behalf of men routinely, uh, I would think. I don't know many that would go to the lengths here to make this incredibly lame joke. 
I agree. Like, I would agree with you broadly that I find it more pathetic than anger-inducing. But I also do, I think it should be acknowledged that we're not the room of people who should decide whether this is something to get angry about or not. You know, like, and that's, I think, just make that point and, you know, that that's all really. But I agree with you. It's just, like, so, like, Tiger, what the... F- What's wrong with you? Like, mm. do you know what I mean? I know a couple of people in my life who I I never known them to do this, but you know the s- silliness on a golf course and wrong with that. And you wouldn't like it's you know you might just roll your eyes at them. You're not going to disown them over it, you know. And but at the same time, I feel like it's happened less and less as I've got you know into my thirties. Yeah. yeah. And Tiger's got ten years on me nearly. You know, and it's like, I don't think in 10 years these same mates are going to be doing this crack. You know, they're be- pr- really not anymore even, you know, and it's just like... You'd always have the joke if someone saddle. duffs a tee, a tee shot and it's like, well, go up to the ladies' tee on the next hole, that kind of thing. I think there's a certain amount of banter culture among golfers around that. Not everyone, but definitely some people that you golf with. The strange part for me is the practicality of Tiger Woods going to get a tampon, putting it into his bag and having it ready for when JT hits a bad tee shot. Like, where does he go? Does he get one of his crew to go and get a tampon for him? Does he bring the tampon from home? <laughs> you really want to know this. No, but, but like, obviously Tiger had to think about it. So it's in his before. possession before he gets on the course. This the, isn't an impromptu joke. Same thoughts. Yeah, has he been doing it for years? Does Maybe he always have out. a supply? Well, you see, the other interesting thing is, uh, you know, at this point, uh, for years, for years he just was a complete... Uh, ignore everyone around him merchant mm. like it's only latterly in the last couple of years maybe since his return to golf in the last four five six years that he has become this avuncular presence that he has become quote unquote friends with the guys like there was much eye rolling in the golf fraternity when he was injured six seven years ago and he's like oh, I just missed the camaraderie and the guys mm. you know quite a few golfers on tour saying really mm. first I've heard of you missing the guys so uh, this is like almost a a, a, a a kind of delayed effort to to bond with those around him. Maybe that's why he's behaving like a guy in his 20s. I don't know. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. It's kind of just trying to recapture, I suppose, some semblance of youth or some semblance of what was missed. It's also some seriously amateur psychology. So I mean, uh, what else? <laughs> serious health warning. I didn't see the degree behind you. Like, yeah. I'm not making any judgments. <laughs> <laughs> so why are the golf media trying to reform his character, particularly since maybe he won the Masters? Because I've noticed this too, where remember he was having a chat with John Ram. I think, was that at JP's tournament? And people were like, oh, look, he's starting to give back to golf now. Yeah. Tiger's a new character. He's now, you know, the old gentleman on tour who wants to bring the game to a better place. Yeah. Well, what's brought this about? I think, to be fair, Golf media generally definitely tries to present the tour as everyone's a great guy. Okay. So that would be the, the, the start and end point. And then when you have Tiger as the greatest gift to every golf journalist's career, uh, I think that exacerbates it further. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, it was interesting. Amanda Balionis, the kind of CBS reporter, had like several sit downs with him after each round for minutes on end and never even just never even a, in a softball way because like there's an argument that you, you could go OTT and like uh, forensically tear them apart and, and maybe some people do feel that that's required here and others will say well we have to have a modicum of perspective but regardless she could have asked like a very softball how do you reflect on it it was all over the news it's not like as if it's something that wouldn't come yeah, but in golf media it was like it never happened mm. there was that one question in the press conference and that was it and I, the, the golf motivation, I just think that's their, that is their general approach uh, with most golfers, and it's certainly their approach with Tiger. And he's a very powerful person in golf. I mean... It's CB- not fear that you're not going to get access oh, if you annoy him. CBS need him. Mm. Might not even be just access. You could be frozen out of everything, you know? Yeah. Like, does, Sorry, this is a tangent, but I suppose this is the place for it, right? But it was just occurring to me there when you said about golf like media being portraying everyone as a good guy. Yeah. I think all one sport, you know, journalists for want of a better word, I don't know, one sport peop you know, uh coverage is like that in a way. I was thinking specifically about the NFL when you say it there. The amount of guys in the NFL like who are in like have done really unforgivable things like, you know, to women or to whatever, like a lot of times in college and they're drafted or whatever and then all we hear about and the coverage is their football credentials, right? But on the same hand, 
they go out of their way to talk about how great other people are. And I always think it's like you can't have both conversations. You can't ignore it on one hand and then tr- you know, trump up how amazing other people are. And they have like a specific thing, like a, every club nominates a Walter Payton Man of the Year. Mm. And all the way through the playoffs, each team's uh, nomination is talked about. And then they announce it like, you know, towards, I think possibly even the day of the Super Bowl. Like it's a big part of the coverage is these guys and what they do go around. But they'll ignore... Joe Mixon or any of these guys who've done like awful things yeah. and just treat tr- football but I do think there's a lot of that like I mean there's a lot of you could pick almost on any sport and you say there's massive hypocrisy here because you just want to promote the game as much as you want to tell the journalistic story Yeah, you know I do think a lot of it is left to people who dip their toe in and out of different things and don't out. live in that world no, you know? I, I agree totally agree totally I suppose um, as, a, as a final thought I, I because I I'm very much on board with the new tiger, like I I, I bought you can see a friendlier person a, a more rounded person I was a bit surprised at this, and again I'm not I'm not instinctively outraged the way I I suspect any female really has the right to like feel it in their gut you know like yeah, just being I, dismissed as nothing again like this, you know what I mean lesser than yeah, yeah. this shit that they probably yeah. have to deal with all the time so I don't have that instinctive not to mention it being linked to like a biological part of their makeup that is just like we literally spent an hour talking about it on the show last week and yeah. how that relates to sport and then that's the way you call someone a woman I know, I know. you know what I mean there is a lot of shit in that as well that really needs to be taken apart and dissected as the nonsense that it is but there is a sort of a stupid lads have been doing this for generations and it's not going to change overnight element to it as well. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But we reckon Tiger's been doing this for years and it's just a good lens that's caught the tampon this time around. Do I think he's been literally given tampons? Yeah. Because, no. <laughs> I'm sure you're saying he didn't talk to them for years. <laughs> I don't. Like, I mean, I'd be... Why, but why start? I mean, I don't mean to get hung up on the practicalities of it, but it, to me it just seems absolutely bonkers. A guy who was in his 40s, a dad himself, that he would bring a tampon onto a golf course in order to give to someone as a rib. Yeah, I actually can't answer it, you know. It's, it's actually <laughs> it's wild. It's not part of your makeup. <laughs> wild. To do it, like, yeah. yeah. Would you, what, but, what, but what I, would but, you say Justin but, Thomas should have done? Well, I don't not know. Not the virtues single him, but if you were, if you were you and you were disgusted by it, you were Wouldn't like, throw it in the fairway. I think I'd take it off and go, geez, what are you doing? Get a hold of yourself. Give it to your caddy, put it in the bag. Yeah. I think uh, you'd Imagine be caught accidentally to laughing. Imagine dressing down <laughs> in public. Yeah. So like, this is disrespectful, Tiger. Like on, the, uh, and I'm gonna. Someone's gonna say, oh, "It's just childish, harmless." Like, calm down. But I do. I, it's just when you're when you're of that stature and you do it so publicly. He's a 15 year old daughter. Like, I'm sorry. I know that's the oldest, you know, like way to this. You know, you're a father. You should be doing better. You know, and it's who cares really? To, to be honest, Tiger Woods in many ways to us is just a fictional character mm. who you know plays a sport better than anyone we've ever seen do it you know and we don't know him or anything about him really but at the same time like you look at him and you go you're you know playing off as this mature guy and you've got a 15 year old daughter and that's the way you see mm. like you know that's, that's womanhood and tampons yeah and, and that I am a bit surprised because I really did like I say uh, love the Woods redemption story yeah you know so I mean his behaviour in the past was much criticised and scandalous and everything else but like uh, a human being is, is multidimensional and he had an odd upbringing and he was given fame at such a young age and made some bad choices. But again, like a big believer in second chances and who are any of us to cast the first stone. So, but I really loved the seemingly more rounded figure, like months on end lying on his couch, reflecting on his life, reflecting on how he wants to be um, more friendly person on tour, like genuinely, like really likable. So I was, I was like, oh man, <laughs> I didn't actually I didn't think this was going on um, Would you still want them to win the Masters? I don't know No I would I have to say I'd separate I, that I, stuff completely I, Separate to a point like it is funny like watching him as a final thought because I've probably talked too much in this watching him like walk up the steps then on Sunday after again it's the like the, the commentary on TV is like as he's putting out an 18 it's like Roger, the joy he's given everyone this week. Like, no mention of what the big story. The joy he's given the patrons this week. Incredible. <laughs> and, like, they're giving it that inspirational. Great to see him back. And he played great golf, by the way, as well. And then, like, he walks up the stairs. And it's, like, people, like, oh, die. It's, like, the adulation. And, like, Michael Johnson was very critical of him. Called him Teflon. Like, there was just something, like, man, as human beings, we're just weird. Like, we're worshipping this guy, but you strip away 
obviously the golfing ability and the aura, the aura. Mm. and it's yeah. like imagine the dude you play with in your club on a random Saturday pull that joke yeah what would you say at about 47 it? years of age at 47 what would you when you got back in and saw your mates and they were like how was your round with Jimmy Eldrick Jim handed me a... What, what, what? <laughs> like you, Eldrick you, fella, lads, he's you would, never... What you would clown. sit down and you'd be like, you'd be like, you gave me a tampon because I didn't hear a good drive. <laughs> you'd what be a, also like, I'm not, I'm not signing up with the sheet with him again. Like, you would. Know? <laughs> so like, and yet, Tiger, t- like, this is the halo effect. I do suspect there's a little bit of a different thing in that American um, thing, though. Like, you, you've got an, an awful lot from the Michael Jordan kind of documentary as well, or the, I suppose, The Last Dance. I think that's true. Where it was. There was an awful lot of stuff going on that I'd say as well stuff that without to be any way prejudicial but like um, things that mightn't have been said on camera that yeah. you can imagine some of what was probably being said that's true like without a shadow of a doubt now that was the 90s and you kind of go but it's just, they're there what are they they're about 13 years apart in age maybe they're thereabouts yeah. so slightly different things but I mean I, yeah I can't imagine I, it's kind of like I, I'm not. You weren't. I wasn't remotely surprised. Were you not? No, no, of course not. I, I, yeah, no, I was, not a chance. I was naively surprised. Uh, just a very brief mention for me. I, I think this is uh, worth saying that the Saudi Ladies Invitational was on over the weekend, and I mean Lydia Ko, world number one, played. Leona Maguire played. Uh, both of him, whom would have been in the seven figures last year and are earning a good living. Um, in the same way that we would criticise the male counterparts, uh, the female tour in particular, partly out of a, a desperation for money, has jumped headfirst into dealings with the Ramco and, and Saudi money, even to the point that all these top players went and played at the Saudi Invitational. So again, there are like no criticism really of them, probably because it's a lower profile sport. But, you know, when it comes to the various ills of that regime, um, no qualms. And, uh, and you compare that, for instance, with some of the soccer players ahead of potential Saudi sponsorship of the World Cup this year who have spoken out uh, very impressively. The female golfers haven't said boo. And it's disappointing. You know, you'd love they stood up a bit more because they can't claim ignorance. And it's a point worth making because if all of the top male players were in Saudi Arabia this week playing golf, there'd be a story. We would skewer them. And the female players, none of them have stood up in so, insofar as I could see. You know what very noticeable as well, Joe? The amount of times in the coverage going into last weekend they referenced the prize money that was available. That yeah. This was the reason the top players are going. There's five and a bit million dollars that are available. And Co. I think, picked up a cheque for $750,000 at the end of it. And it was almost being praised as, here's a massive tournament on the ladies' tour and a chance for them to earn big money. Yeah. As, and that was basically the focus of the whole tournament. But that's the golf media. Yeah. Well... What I was going to say is that there is a sense of like that women's golf is in a more precarious position than than men's or a lot of other men's sport and that there is a, I suppose there's a natural inclination to think like, you know, that they're just going to have to suck it up and, you know, manage it. But I think you've probably laid out why that might not actually be the case here, at least among the top, top players, you know, mm. it's a, it's a, they're, they're well compensated um, it, probably a lot more than a lot of other women's sport you know? yeah it, I mean Aramco have signed up for eight tournaments so it's like well you have to dodge every every one of those eight and then suddenly it is a big sacrifice so I, I understand it's slightly different from the, from the male situation but it is worth mentioning I haven't seen it mentioned anywhere Dennis Walsh in the Irish Times highlighted the lack of criticism at a similar point last season and here we are again and very little has been said about it Michael, you are struck by the whale strike and what it tells us. Uh, yeah, I suppose. So my, I was just reading about the strike today, and it was the usual one of the one of the columnists has started to turn on the players a little bit. It's very very slowly happening, and basically how the if if they cost the WRU nine million and don't go ahead with this game, and Welsh rugby goes into utter financial crisis because of it, and people don't get their England match people will turn on the players, right? So I think that's nonsense, to be honest. But while thinking, I was thinking, this is an awful position for players to be in. And there is a sporting element to it that is different from your average day-to-day job, right? So you don't grow up to be your job to be a rugby player. You grow up with a dream of playing to Wales, playing for Wales or Ireland or whoever, as your hobby is going out after school, weekends, playing rugby 
and becoming the best you can be at it over time, it turns from kind of like joy to a dream to maybe a passion and eventually to your professional uh, endeavour. Mm. And so it's not just like any other job where you go, right, we're not getting treated correctly. Your dream is to play in the Millennium Stadium in front of 80,000 people against England. And you might have to give that up for what's right here. You know, I don't think it will ultimately come to that in this particular case. But in general, sport sports strikes are a very, very different thing than, you know, me or you striking for workers' rights, you know what I mean? And it does, I think it puts an even more awkward position in them that they know that even though I don't think the Welsh rugby fans are going to turn on them, they do know that they're depriving people of one of the biggest days of their entire year. For people who are seriously into sport, you know, that sort of one, two days on the calendar is a huge, huge event for them, you know? Um, so that's, that's all. I, I, I'll put it out there. It's unusual because the leverage is so different to someone else who has an industrial dispute with their employer, where potentially you go outside the gates for a couple of weeks and then go back to work if it's settled. While in the case of a sports person, a big fixture particularly, and putting that under threat, is pretty much the only way to use your leverage to actually get reform change. Like I think back to the Irish women's team, go to Liberty Hall, they were going to pull down a fixture, I think it was against Slovakia, the next week, and that was a threat to the FEI that they were going to do it. And in the case of Wales, this is a huge money spinner, probably the most profitable game that they're going to play in the Six Nations this season. I'm sure none of them would want the fixture not to go ahead, but so, yes, this is the only way to back the yeah. WRU. So, so what, I, I'm not following, what, what is the nugget, what's our point here? We're surmising events, what's our talking point? My point is that I, uh, I think that it's a very strange thing for a sports person to have to choose strike as their option. Okay. And I suppose it's a little bit more complicated than I would say an everyday job. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There might not be much more to say to it. <laughs> no, no, yeah, it's true. No, I get, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But there's part of, like even as like I don't care about Welsh rugby. I don't care about like you know I think that very clear. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's like whatever. Like I care. I I think in terms of like this story in particular, I think they're being re- incredibly harshly treated. But that's not the conversation I want to have. I'm sort of thinking if it's like there's a part of me that hopes like they do the right thing and go ahead. But uh, even then, me as the most casual viewer of all time will say oh geez it'd be a pity we don't have that England Wales match well it's live on Virgin you know what I mean? it'd, be a, it'd be a pity for you yeah, but you know off. what I mean so you can imagine how you feel if you're a proper like Welsh fan who has tickets for this game and is going up the card for it and it's it's like you know a huge part of your year yeah. and those those lads have to take that into account too but at the same time they might also have to take into account that they're being utterly screwed yeah I think, I think the Welsh public will be on their side no yeah oh they might be yeah as opposed to the, this union which is disgraced I think they will be yeah uh, can I get your thought the Commentary around Graham Potter has just been such a feature this week. And so I was parodying a lot of it to Pat Nevin last night, whilst also thinking it's ridiculous. Um, that Potter is too reasonable, he's been described as too normal, um, all of these kind of things. And I was saying to you guys last night that I have the Moneyball test, where I imagine the old dudes around the table with Brad Pitt, and he's shaking his head in despair at the cliches they're, they're throwing out, i.e. that guy can't be a good player, he's got an ugly girlfriend means he's no confidence these kind of things and in Potter's case some of the commentary around his appearance around his demeanour <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense I guarantee you if they were winning games these things would be pointed to as like players in this day and age they want that kind of mature person they, they're, they're different now they don't want Mourinho screaming at them or equally if he was behaving like a lunatic and Thomas Tuchel and getting into scraps with Conte but still losing they w- I guarantee you a huge quotient the same people criticising now would be saying he's gone up a level you can't behave like this God, where, where's the composure and it just it just points to like just the idiocy of sports <laughs> media genuinely and like, is it top of the head idiot. stuff or are they talking to people who are saying this in positions of do you know because if it's just I, if it's just like a theory that don't like the look of him I tell you what it shit is shit manager I can tell you exa- <laughs> here's what it is they have to say something and two they have so little information then mm. it's all we have to go on. So they've no idea what his coaching sessions are like. They've no idea what's going on behind the scenes. This is the only available information they have. But the Therefore, other information is that Chelsea aren't getting any points. Yeah. Yeah. So they have to mould those two things together yeah. and marry it. But there, there's no insight. And yet it's been just like, honest, like, it's just been discussed at every level. The one that really got me was a couple of weeks ago when he was being criticised for not being critical of referees. Decisions had gone against Chelsea. Yeah. It was 
Potter's too nice. Yeah. You need to step in and actually talk about those. So actually, not abusing referees was being used as negative against. Yeah. Yeah, but there is a degree of that. There is to which it works. You do have to have a little bit of sort of those machinations. Like I know everything goes back to sort of you say Ferguson is the extreme of whatever else or the um, superb operator of these different things and he would routinely get involved in that stuff. But they all do. Klopp does, everyone does, right across the board. Even this week, everyone kind of, the, the narrative now pushed out there, Saka needs more protection. Mm. Saka needs, more, we need to protect this boy. This guy, he needs, he needs help. Yeah. And it's like, but that, I, I think that there is a degree of that to which you need to show. I, I, I genuinely believe that from a player's perspective, it's nice to see your manager doing something for you okay, or trying something for you he doesn't have to be shouting or roaring but like at least to show that he has this under control we, he knows what he's doing here yes and I, I don't, I'm not I'm not in any judgment do we know Potter. that Potter's not doing that though I suppose not doing the, it publicly which yeah, is, like okay. again it is very much his public behaviour yeah he could be gr- like he could be screaming at them in training and a, and a real hard ass in training I but doubt I think, it I think that even in control and having your back point you know what I mean I think that's a that's a lot um, more believable to, to think that Potter does have that more behind the scenes and is just trying to, you know, project a calm yeah. exterior to the media, which is, you know, there's a point of like, as you as you rightly say, I think that could be portrayed, if they were doing well, that would be portrayed as a virtue. Why are we keep saying that if they're not doing well? <laughs> like he is there and they're not well, doing a, well. Uh, do you know what? No, that, no, <laughs> that's actually a really but, good point though. But because, are they not doing well because he's, quote, too normal? Well, I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't but know. But Pat I, Nevin made the point last night right now, and I don't think Chelsea are, like, doing too well, but he's saying, like, there is a bit of fine margins. If you take the last three games, they should have beaten West Ham. They had they actually played very, very well in what he described as a great game against Dortmund. Yeah. We didn't see that match. We were watching the other game that yeah. night. But it was described as a great game. They were unlucky to lose it. A draw would have been a fair result away in they Dortmund. Were, I, I was and watching then, that. They were. They were and, really. then, and then they... Um, Whatever they had a bit of a weird like yeah. it, so it could be you know, one of those one of and those freak got, results against Southampton at the weekend. Is it a freak? He's got thirty three players blinking well, the, and back given the match. Training. I mean, sorry, not that the yeah yeah not that given the losing most, Southampton the most unwieldy squad and he's a manager who likes to build week after week on what's done in training. He's got thirty three lads looking at him going. We're the, we're the most bizarre squad in the history of football. Do most something of us aren't getting the game. And again, not to because we don't know ultimately. We yeah. don't know, but like. He's been in charge when all those signings were made. As if he he didn't but, sign them. But my point is, at no point does he have the authority even to go hold on. I don't. Yeah. This this is what will happen if you do this. But Tuchel tried, and you yeah. know what happened. Tuchel re- apparently would say to Bowley, "That's a stupid idea. <laughs> <laughs> we're not we're doing pot, that." Pot, well that. Took it. Yeah. <laughs> so do you you do you, you you think there is something in the? You I need think to be a tu- a touch mad now to be an elite yeah, manager I don't I, I think it's, it's probably it's too simplistic to make a, a snap judgement on him but I do think typically yeah. successful managers tend to have a bit that when they walk in the room the room is theirs see right now I'm Brad Pitt and you're the old guy I'm the old guy yeah and I'm on the way out <laughs> yeah, but you but won't win a championship and I might get signed by the Yankees <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure which is true but it, even if what you're saying is true it's mad to me the professional athletes that are like at the top of the like the top elite elite of the most played sport in the world are making are judging books by the cover like that. Do you know what I mean? That they're going in and go, this guy has nothing. But wait, like, that's and, and therefore downing tools as but, opposed to even but, playing yeah. against it. You know, publishers spend so much money on the covers of books because that's exactly what humans do. Yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely. I just you think all, that you get to a point yeah, where yeah, 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 they're yeah. better than us in to, some ways. You know, it, yeah. to completely undercut my own argument, which is not a great thing to do. <laughs> Damien Delaney would tell you that the a dressing room really is that superficial. Now you yeah. have to back it up with what you're doing training. But he has like named certain managers he's played for and just said, oh, he had the aura. So we just sort of yeah. believed him. Mm. I definitely think it carries you for a while. It, it probably won't sustain you, but yeah. like it definitely, it's funny when you look back at so many of the things, the Man United things post Ferguson said where they were at different heights. So many of it comes, so many of the relative kind of high points come under Mourinho, which is like, if you look back on the face of it, the most traumatic <laughs> area of all of them. Yeah. But he just has something, I suppose, that motivates people for a whole little while, you know, and whatever else it works to varying degrees but is it just a natural charisma thing is, is it something that you can portray like if Graham Potter came in and was like <laughs> and Graham Potter goes Rah! and he starts throws a chair dresser and goes things are gonna change around here boys like if he did that what do you want they just him? think it they just think <laughs> this, who is this clown what century is he living in he has you know? started dressing in, a, in he's trying to dress yeah. the part of continental managers lives in West London now <laughs> there is like, a bit of that yeah. expensive polo necks yeah. and Dressing like Stephen Baldwin in uh, Usual Suspects, as I said yeah, last night. Exactly. Yeah, stand by that. Yeah, it was top of the head last night, but 
So he is crafting some kind of image, but it's like the erudite, calm figure, detached. Is he going to start wearing a beret? <laughs> oh my. And painting. That's where he's going. <laughs> the one I can't understand, A Joe, beatnik from 1960s Greenwich Village. We've got this perception about Potter, and I think it's genuinely there since he got the job. That it was almost like it's ill-fitting for him to be there. And I was looking at some of the stories even today. The Telegraph have got one which is like, this is the reason Chelsea behind the scenes haven't sacked him just yet. Mm. Almost this feeling that's inevitable that it's not going to work out for him. And yet, for some reason, Newcastle, who can't buy a win at the moment in the Premier League, seem to be entirely immune from criticism with the bad run they're on and the fact they've now slipped out of the top four. Yeah. If you are reading most of the papers or listening to the conversation around Newcastle, you'd be thinking, this team must be sitting inside the top four, they're going to qualify for the Champions That's mad you say that. I was listening to something about Newcastle. I think it was um, oh, one of the journalists that covers Newcastle was on uh, Sky Sports News on like Sunday morning. They just lost again. They were talking about the League Cup final and they were talking about the feel good or and, and he goes, he goes, you know, it's all gone so well with the Eddie Howe factor and all this. I was like, what do you mean the Eddie Howe factor? They've won a game since Christmas. <laughs> it's, like, it's the Eddie Howe factor. It's, it's, Eddie Howe factor. it's like, it's like why, whoa, who, when did Eddie Howe get beatified? Like, when did that actually happen? Six months ago. Has been the Bruno yeah. factor. Like, since Bruno's got injured, their form has gone out the window. And yeah. We, sh- we should, uh, we got to wrap up. Uh, we're so yeah. over time. We That's should, on, I, from, on the uh, Potter cliche point, we, we do need to do a conversation about like the worst cliches in sports journalism. Because there, uh, genuinely, there's not been a Hurley match won without character Yeah. in the history of but analysis. That, that, That's that, actually true. Yeah. That Brian <laughs> that Brian's Gunn's Twitter uh, account is oh, yeah. such a funny it's breakdown. Having just, a moment. But it's such a funny breakdown. Of, look, these, these are so infiltrated. Oh They're God. everywhere. I love that we actually featured one of them last week, I think. Did we? A Laurel clip got in there from... Oh, yeah. I think so, yeah. Oh, what, yeah. what was that one? The football, most recent football I saw was, man, I think. Was it Rolls Royce of players? Could have been Rolls Royce of players, yeah. The most recent one I saw was it's a potential banana skin or it's a banana skin. <laughs> Can I make a direct appeal <laughs> to the listeners to possibly remind us of this with an email to... Oh, yeah. Like, off the ball. Like, oh, because we'll forget. Yes, could you email in? So, again, I do feel like if a hurler catches a slitter, the character <laughs> is screened. <laughs> I want all your just nonsense. As if the player next to him has no character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Akin to Tiger Woods. As if it's a... Uh, you know, a, 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 an exposing of his character or non-character. We leave so many loose ends, like even down to the fact that a couple of weeks ago we went, we're going to talk about Joe's knocking. No Where's his knocking? <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're way out of time. Uh, I will come back to that. It's not, a great, it's not a great folks, story. Cut the camera. Cut the camera. It's a slightly personal picture in the front of that. Oh, yeah. sorry. Oh, I don't think so. I didn't need to light it up. It's all right. Cut uh, a blur it there, SKG. We are done. Will, thank you very much. Cheers, lads. Michael, thank you. Thank you, I'm sorry about that. No, uh, Will, Michael fight this week, obviously, you know. Well, Arthur. And Arthur. And I'm, I'm the reasonable one here. Yeah, you're the reasonable one. No, Arthur McFight this week, so it gets deducted two stars out of ten for starters. But Sorry, Arthur. I was seven for the office. Okay. What were we meant to fight about? I don't know. I'm not sure. Something <laughs> unimportant. Uh, we will be back maybe next week. Bye-bye.